<clears throat> Good evening, my true clues aficionados. I hope you all are doing well out there, taking care of yourself, looking out for each other. If you're seeing something, ready to say something. And tonight's case, um, I really did a, like a deep dive on this one. It's another Colorado crime. I do love to cover cases that are close to home. Um, I do remember when this one was going on, but I was actively working, I think, a couple of different ones. So I'm circling back to it now. Um, this case is still in progress. So anything I say right now is strictly... Um, you know, surmising, thinking, what if none of this is written in stone right now um, because the verdict hasn't been made. There has been a preliminary hearing. The affidavit was like 50 pages long in this case. <clears throat> and it is regarding a family. And this case is currently regarding a family in <clears throat> Good evening, my true clues aficionados. I hope you all are doing well out there, taking care of each other, ready to say something if you're seeing something. Tonight's case is really hitting close to home. It it took place in here in Aurora, Colorado. It was about a year ago. The verdict has not been made yet. So anything I say on this is something, my thoughts on the case, nothing written in stone, nothing directed at the person, um, simply my thoughts on the case up till now. And that doesn't mean that, you know, my thoughts are what's going to happen, but it is a take on the case from the research that I've done recently. And um, it uh, it's in regards to what would be known as a happy little couple. On the outside, it was a good um, Mormon family. They had six children. They had been married for about 23, 24 years. At the time of the transpiring of events, one child did 
turned to be 18 years old that left three children under 18 at the time. And a few of the siblings have moved out and are living on their own right now. Um, when this first happened, there was a GoFundMe that was set up to provide care for these children because they had lost both of their parents pretty close to the same time. And um, although they did give the appearance that they were in love with each other and they spent all of their time with each other, as we all know that there was things playing in the background there. Um, <clears throat> when you see them, they presented as a very loving couple, but of course there were things going on in the background. Apparently he may have had some issues, gambling, affairs, and um, maybe not managing money very well. They would work out in the morning together. He just loved, you know, working out together, supposedly. And he would fix her these breakfast smoothies with all the vitamins and nutrients that you need to get through the day. And they would work out. Then they would go to work. I don't know if it was at the same time or not. Uh, 48 hours did say she was a dentist, but the... Um, guy that I'm following, the K News guy, said that she worked in the office and was helping out there. Um, that doesn't mean she was doing dentistry work. It sounds like he was. So um, they were working, living their best life. And like I said, they were had the six kids. I guess they were very active in their church. And, you know, life was going on. Well, one day, Angela started feeling ill she couldn't explain why didn't know why um eventually ending up at uh parker adventist hospital they looked at her they couldn't determine what was wrong with her it was pretty serious she was feeling pretty badly and um eventually she felt a little bit better and she went home and you know not too long after that she got sick again and she ended up back at Porter Adventist again. Again, they were unable to identify the actual cause of her illness, what was going on, what caused this to go on. And, you know, all the whole time that this is going on and she's in the hospital or, you know, urgent care, wherever she's ending up at the time, she's in consistent texting with her husband. As many of us do, you know, when you're married, you know, levels of, communication are different but this is like a serious situation so she's texting him and she's telling him how she doesn't feel good and he's trying to surmise what it could be did they check this did they look at that and uh, she's like you know we'll see what happens well there was like I said nothing determinate from those two visits so she goes home that day because she's starting to feel a little bit better uh, spending time with the kids you know and you, there are so many text messages exchanging between him and her, identifying the fact that she doesn't feel good. She's having headaches, memory loss. Her stomach doesn't feel good. She's really not wanting to eat. On some days she wants her smoothie. On other days she doesn't. But, you know, most of the time she's having the smoothie. And then when she's in the hospital, you know, she's like, I don't feel good. I haven't really eaten. He's like, do you want me to bring something? She's like, yeah. So he would stop at a restaurant, grab something for her, or again, bring her her little smoothie. So all of this was transpiring during the time that she was in and out of the hospital and not feeling well. And of course, her office members and at counterparts were concerned as to what was going on with her as well. So... um not knowing what was going on or where to look, the hospital was in a conundrum. They're not really sure what was going on at the time. And by the time they figure out what's going on, of course, it's too late for poor Angela. Then in, uh, this was all taking place around March of 2023. March 6th is when she had, you know, the really bad headache, higher blood pressure, so concentration, <clears throat> She had called her Jim at the office and she's like, hey, you know what, I'm really not feeling that well. And then you can see, you know, where he's texting her, keeping an eye on her. But at some point in all of this texting, you're like, 
why was there never this suggestion to, hey, you know, he eventually does take her to the doctor, but there was a long time that had transpired before he took her to the doctor. And I'm like, well, if that would have been my loved one, there would only be so much time that's going to transpire before I'm going to say, hey, let's get this crap taken care of. Let's find out what's going on. Let's get to the bottom of this. So, uh, you know, things go on and it was uh, later found out that there had been three poisoning attempts on Angela. The first being arsenic. And um, this method, it does take a long time to work. But when they did check her hair, they found out that she had been, uh, you know, put in quite the predicament. And then I guess the next one was arsenic cyanide. And then... She ended up in there again and started feeling good. They sent her home again. The last time, the very third time she went in, she did not recover. She did not make it out. And if they did use the um, sodium potassium on her, that is guaranteed, you know, to stop you dead in your tracks, shut your breathing system down, and then you're gone. And the arsenic, I guess it just makes you feel bad until you go down. There was a search about Oleander on his computer. And that is another type of poison that may have been the third thing or last thing in, you know, one of the three attempts that was made on her life. So, um, he had, during this time, had been re going to receive a package over at their medical office. Now, their medical office was on Ponderosa Medical Offices. It was just right over um, by where I used to live when I lived in Aurora. I'd even been to the building for some services myself. Not to that dental clinic, though. They had a dental business, and it was called Summerbrook Dentistry. The K News guy that I was following his podcast on was a, you know, semi-friend uh, patient of Dr. Jim. And so he was shocked and surprised to find out, you know, what was going on. But it definitely pulled him into the case to know, you know, hey, this guy was treating me. I know his wife. He said he didn't know her personally, but he had talked to her that he knew the doctor much better because the doctor also did advertising with the, his radio station that he worked at at the time. So there was that correlation and there was a little bit of time that had transpired. So he kind of felt like he knew this guy. So um, in the meantime, Dr. Jim was getting a package and it was going to the offices. And he calls and he's like, look, you know, I'm going to be getting a package there. It's personal. Please don't open it. So the person that took the call didn't open it, but didn't bother to leave any notification for anybody else. If this package come, don't open it. So the nurse opened it and she saw that and she was like, what in the hell? So he had had some financial situations going on and maybe that led to the gang gambling and, you know, whatever else he was doing, gambling, women, whatever he had there on the side. So this friend of his that had been a friend of his or he had been a college acquaintance and they were then friends came in to help him with the business because his business was suffering and it was going down the tubes. He didn't have enough money to keep it going. So Dr. Ryan came in. The nurse finds this, <clears throat> excuse me, the nurse finds this canister. She becomes concerned. She goes to Dr. Ryan. She's like, Dr. Ryan, what the hell? Dr. Ryan's like, I don't know, but, you know, we need to let somebody know about this because he made the connection that, um, you know, the wife had been getting ill, had been going through all this thing, appearing like poisoning, connecting the dots, and then became very suspicious of Dr. Jim. So, he, um, this is the nurse that's treating Angela at the time. And so Dr. Ryan says, hey, you know, I think something's going on here. Well, you know, the nurse has an obligation in her position to call the police and let them know, you know, there could be a possible homicide attempt. Yeah. 
So she seemed to let it get a little bit better before going downhill for the last time. And if you look at the text messages and stuff, right before she got really sick and expired, he was bringing her outside food and drink. She went to University Hospital, which is actually walk, walking distance from where I used to live. It was a big deal getting that in. Um, it used to be in lower downtown. <coughs> it, excuse me, my allergies. For her third and last visit, she was over at University Hospital. University Hospital is just right off of Colfax and I believe Peoria uh, would be the biggest cross streets to there. It was really close to my old house when I lived in the city. And um, they checked her in. She wasn't feeling good. She got a little bit better. In that meantime, Dr. Jim did bring her outside, you know, source of sustenance drink and food then and I believe it was after that I'm not sure we'll find out as the trial goes on there but I do believe that's what the affidavit was saying that she then became much more ill at that point in time she then became that much she became So her third and last visit, <laughs> so her third and last visit was to University Hospital. And when she was first there, she did start to feel better and then she took a turn for the worst and she ended up expiring there at the hospital. I do believe during that time that Dr. Jim did bring her some outside sustenance. I don't know. That'll bear truth as the trial goes through, but I do believe that's what happened. And, you know, she seemed to go downhill pretty quickly after feeling better for some reason. And after that expired very quickly. And the interesting part about it is, you know, during the last episode of those podcasts, he did bring on a poisonologist or an arsenicologist or whatever. He did say that her symptoms did not match the symptoms that are known for the drug that they are telling in the case was used to, you know, off her. <clears throat> he seemed to think there could be other forces at play that maybe somebody was setting up him, him up. He didn't naturally say that out loud, but he said it was kind of suspicious circumstances, the way the accusations were coming out. So whether this is true, because I don't know that much about poisoning, they do say it has become quite a bit more popular recently for whatever reason. They seem to think that <clears throat> the person that is getting uh, poisoned will not notice the difference. And then, you know, be like, hey, I don't feel well. And then the person, you know, like in this instance is like, hey. And I do believe that uh, Dr. Jim, you know, in his text message was very caring and very knowing. But how many times have you seen on a crime show where the text messages that, it, you know, go back and forth between a couple or whatever provide proof that, you know, this person is responsible for expiring the person at hand. So it's kind of interesting all the way around as far as that goes. And, you know, then the truth that came out afterwards about Dr. Jim activities and the do not open to the nurse and, you know, the sodium potassium, 
he ordered the sodium potassium off of Amazon, if you can believe it or not. And it was like $13. And he could order it because he had a DEA number. He said he was doing some facial reconstruction and needed this to do some electrolysis on some metals, which I guess is a pretty normal thing that goes down for the type of uh, situation that he was referring to. But apparently the whole world was in shock that you were able to get on Amazon and order that. And I guess there's other places that you can order it as well. So he had this uh, email. It was jamandwaffles at gmail.com. And this was his alternative id, I believe. Um, he was out there ordering um, or doing research, you know, on different poisonings. He also talked to his side pieces on that email. I mean, he was just living his best life with that email because nobody knew about it. So he had gone to a convention out in Vegas and he met himself a girl. And I don't know how deeply involved they were. She was did this little TV show. She said they would only be, you know, a few times. But she did fly out here to Colorado a couple of times to be with him as well. But she was also aware, she tries to say that he had a wife and was concerned as to what was going to the wife. And maybe he said, you know, hey, she's just so sick. I don't know what's going on. I need a side piece. You know, I need some support or whatever. And her marriage wasn't good. So whatever happened, she ended up getting a divorce in the long run, which is the way it should have been. And... um the nurse, of course, did, you know, rat him out and let him know that he had stuff coming there that was highly suspicious. The office manager also found his behavior quite suspicious during that time. He kept going into uh, treatment room number nine. He'd be in there in the dark, I guess, you know, looking at his phone, doing research. When they looked at what he was doing, um, he was definitely working the internet there, doing his thing, looking up stuff he was not supposed to, this type of poisoning, how does that act, where can you get that, the whole oleander thing, which is a highly poisonous uh, flower. And so the office manager thought that was weird and ratted him out for that type of behavior as well. So everybody was like, hmm, this guy's acting like a big jerk. So... He definitely, I mean, I don't know how many people have, you know, multiple emails. I do not. After Angela passed away, um, he, it was only a couple of days after that passed before he was also arrested for suspicion of that crime. So when Angela was in the hospital, Ryan and I believe his wife's name was Michelle, Angela and Jim were all like friends. They would do stuff together outside of work. So they were definitely concerned as to what was going on with Angela and what was going down and thought the whole thing was suspicious behavior as well. So when... Angela was in the hospital at University Hospital, and Michelle and Ryan had been up there to see her. They thought the whole thing, you know, stunk like rotten meat that had been sitting on the floor for days. So he goes down to his car, and they're on Bluetooth, and him and Dr. Jim, Dr. Jim and Dr. Ryan are speaking. And Dr. Jim is like, yo, dude, you know, don't, you know, go to the policia because if you do, I'm going to get in trouble and I can explain what's going on. So he's trying to pass off some kind of crazy ass crap about how him and Angela, they used to joke around with each other all the time because they're just horrifically funny individuals. And they always used to tease each other about trying to off themselves just expiring themselves off the face of the earth. <laughs> and that's why he ordered that so um that last poison. The sodium cyanide or whatever you want to call it. And they're like, what? Yeah, I was just going to use it as a joke on her because she's always telling us that she wants to expire her. Well, that's an interesting story because... He had tried to poison her once before. 
he provided her the story that he wanted to off himself, and apparently that's what he used to talk about. I think one day he figured, why do it to me when I can just do it to you? So he tried to, like, put her in an extreme sleep state, he said, so she he would not be able to stop him from enacting his dreams of expiring himself. I don't even know what to say about that, but that's what he's trying to tell Dr. Ryan. And, you know, don't please don't talk to the Popo because that's what was going on. It was just a big joke between the two of us. But then, you know, the story varies. He may have he had it for her. He may have had it for him. Just as crazy as can be. What kind of person? What kind of story? Oh, my God. That's when you're really clutching at straws, if you ask me. So... Eventually, Ryan gets fed up with the conversation. He's like, look, just shut your mouth and get a lawyer. End of conversation. Okay. <sighs> That's, you know, and then, of course, Ryan had already told the care nurse there what his thoughts were, and she had to contact the authorities, and thing went from there. it was so sad I have to keep referring to my notes because I wanted everything to kind of be in order it was so sad to me in the text messages that transpired between the two of them you know he's always claiming to check up on her and he's concerned but even though she's there on death's bed she is always 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 concerned with his health and well-being and the kids and they talk about feeding and you know regular mundane things that mothers only are going to well, well mothers mostly but only be concerned about their children so the truth comes forward later you know that he's a womanizer he was a gambler and basically uh Oh, yeah, he also had a porno addiction. And, you know, that's an expensive addiction, especially with online crap nowadays. It just all costs you some kind of money. So that wasn't good at all. <clears throat> so I think that it was surprising to her, you know, as quickly as that happened. But according to... What I've read about the poison, you know, that it just shuts down your breathing system right away and you pass away, which is why the poisonologist or the narcissologist said that it was unusual that she would have had to be hospitalized if that was the type of drug that was used for poisoning her. Now, I don't know. Like I said, all of this should come out in court. Um, it was interesting... <clears throat> to me in the text messages that were transpired between the two of them that at one point you know he would try to get a little spicy with her and she never acknowledged the text message or never responded to him she just you know fall off the face of the earth and then pick up later like that text never happened and i think that's from somebody who's <laughs> ick as they call it with that part of their life um you know, and the texts are awfully supportive, but how many crime shows have you watched where, you know, there's text messages or crap like that to support what happened to the victim? So, okay. So I could be 100% off on this, but after, as I'm looking at it and feeling it, my feelings on the subject are he's like a modern day John Liss. And, you know, that John Lisk was the guy who lost his job back in the early black and white days, you know, TV wise. And um, he would go to work every day, but he really didn't have a job that he was going to. He had a very expensive house, had all of his kids and his mom living with him. One day he goes home and he just offs the whole family, turns the air conditioning on, throws the bodies all in a pile. He takes off and he goes living his best life. He remarries again has you know all that crap going on by the time they find out who he is where he is and what's going on with him he's already an old man and that family had been off for quite some time 
So if what they're saying about Dr. Jim is true, I do believe that it was a combination of that thing. You know, he that he really did care about his family and his kids, especially his wife, but he did not want her to find out the truth about him. And he was willing to go to whatever extent he had to to get that done. But at the same time, he'd always been, you know, living his best double life. So that wasn't going to stop. That's why he continued to see chickies on the side. But also, the how long can you cover up the fact that, you know, your crap is falling apart? You got a family that you're taking care of. You're all in the same business. So if you go down, she goes down, house goes down, everything goes down. Even though he was a very quiet individual, like Dr. Ryan says, you don't know what happens inside of a person. You don't know what a person's thinking on the inside. So we'll find out. We shall find out what this affidavit and what kind of proof they have to back it up and just how true it is. For those who don't believe, we'll find out. I don't know. I don't want to make any snap judgments, but it just gives my stomach that John Lisk feeling. Whatever it is, my condolences to Angela, Prey, Craig, his family, and children. With that, my true aficionados, I'll see you on the next episode.